Good morning. Good morning. How are we doing? Good, how are you? Well, let's see, it's Wednesday. We made it this far, so uh, yeah, I can't complain too much. <laughs> We're here. You know, they say- Always good. Yeah, that's like 99% of everything, right? You gotta just show up. So that's what they yep. mean, at least. Every day is a good day above ground. Oh yeah. Yep. <laughs> so how how is life treating you? Busy but good. I've got to get that statement into you. I forgot to do it yesterday. Oh yeah, I would appreciate that. Yeah, and uh, and some kind of image that represents you. So. Okay, doke. We'll do. Yeah, either a drawing of you could be a photograph if if, if it has to be. But you know, gonna be a gravitor. It's going to be a what? An avatar? An avatar, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let's not do avatars, okay? <laughs> the gravatar. Yeah, let's not do avatars. Okay. okay, all right. No avatars, okay. Cute, and yeah, I think there's an appropriate place for them. Mm, seen our show? Mm, I don't know about that. So, anyway, that's just my my feeling, but. Anyhow, Alrighty. Um, so have you been painting any? I try to put the brush on our canvas every day. So good, good. Yeah, it yeah. might it might be a, a one or two strokes, but it's something. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we're gonna yeah we're gonna do a little talking about painting today. Um, I've been. Um, you know, doing a, a little bit of digging and research um, over the week that I was off. Uh, I spent time at my house over in Valley, Alabama. And so um, I took two trips. Um, one day I went to Columbus, Georgia and uh, got to visit with my sister. But I also got to check out the local art store there. And uh, that was educational all in itself. Um, you you can pretty much so outside of Atlanta, okay. Once you get down to places like Columbus and things like that, your art materials will cost a good f probably thirty to forty percent more per item. Wow. Yeah. I per guess I better order from Atlanta. Well, oh, they're price gouging. Yeah, they've kind of got the market cornered, but uh, literally I saw some frames uh, down there that I've paid like 70 and $80 for here in Atlanta, and they're wanting like 260 for them. Wow. For the very same frame. And it's like, okay, I can drive to Atlanta from Columbus, you know, it's a two hour drive. <laughs> you know, and you know, I mean, I'm I'm all for, you know, and I understand, you know, they got to make a profit and stuff and, and they probably don't have nearly as high a turnover there in uh, merchandise as uh, you would have in a store in Atlanta. So they got to keep the doors open. I, I understand that. But you're paying, you're paying an awful lot for that convenience of being able to buy locally. Uh, now, I will say everything I saw there, really good quality art materials, really nice frames. You know, they didn't have a lot of cheap uh, frames and stuff like that. Like if you go into uh, Joann's or Michael's or things like that, the framing isn't exactly high end stuff. Um, but you know, they, they did, they had some really, really good quality uh, framing and stuff there. You know, it was a uh, well-organized, you know, um, nice nicely presented store um and they had a little bit of everything you know for everybody you know which was good you know i mean it's um uh, <clears throat> you know for a local art store they just need another local art store there to compete against <laughs> and keep the prices kind of balanced out a little bit but um uh, but I, I went down there um and I saw that. I didn't get to the Columbus Museum. I had wanted to go by there, but I did stop by the uh, 
you know, Columbus uh, State University. Okay, it used to be Columbus College, now it's Columbus State University. And I actually went to the Bo Bartlett Art Center. They've named the Art Center after him now. And I walked through there. And uh, again, they've expanded that art department and everything. They've got beautiful facilities down there, uh, you know, for all of the art classes and studio spaces and things. It's really, really quite nice down there. So, uh, you know, it was nice to go down there and just take the tour. Uh, How far is Columbus from Valley? Uh, about 35, 40 minutes. You know, it's, it's not that far. Um, you know, I can just head south out of Valley and right into Phoenix City and then across the bridge into Columbus. It actually takes more time to get across Columbus than it does to get to Columbus. It's crazy, but, you know, just the roads and, you know, the amount of traffic down there. Columbus has actually grown into quite a large place. <laughs> you know, it's quite busy down there. So, uh, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's not that far away. And of course, you know, it's, it's kind of funny, you know, going to LaGrange. Um, it's about probably, you know, about 20 minutes. Um, you know, Opelika and uh, Auburn are about maybe, you know, 20 to 30 minutes. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it doesn't take long to get, you know, anywhere there, which is nice. Um, you know, and it's, it's the thing is, it's like you go to those places and, and there's lots of people, right? You go back to Valley, it's really quiet. <laughs> there's very little there, you know, at least not much going on. You know, even the roads, you know, it's like you see a car going up and down every once in a while. You know, not, not very often, so. So yeah, it, it's it's a, it's a very different vibe, you know, from one place to the other, and uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, you know, I haven't heard anything back, you know, from uh, you know the powers that be yet, as far as whether you know I'll be able to continue doing Zoom classes and things, you know, from you know from Valley uh, or keep you know teaching remotely. Um, we'll, we'll see, you know, uh, that's still hanging out there. That could happen. And I'm, I'm kind of hoping it would, um, that would be nice to, you know, just more or less can kind of continue on, but be able to do it, you know, from where I live, um, would be nice. And, uh, so again, you know, it's all up in the air. We're waiting, we're seeing, so we'll, we'll see how that goes. Let's see how many, what do we got? Well, we got eight people here. Okay, welcome one and all. Uh, happy Wednesday, okay. Um, today I wanted to share with you uh, a particular painter. Um, I've mentioned his name before. Uh, I don't think I've ever really shown his work specifically, um, but you know, that uh, that's generally just because there's too darn many people out there. Uh, we're doing really, really good stuff, and uh, he's one of them. Now, the thing is, um, you know, he's been around for a very, very long time, and uh, his name is Max Ginsburg, and uh, Max kind of hangs out with people, you know, uh, like Bert Silverman, uh, Daniel Green, uh, Richard Schmid, you know, when I was alive, I mean, they all knew each other. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, he's, he's one of those people out there in the, in the art world, uh, particularly with contemporary American realism um, that you can't ignore. You know, he, he's got some phenomenal work. And I'm going to share a little bit of that with you uh, through a YouTube video. And then we're going to watch a series of, uh, of, of demos that he is given. It's a three-part series on a portrait. Uh, all together, the three demos, they're about 15 minutes each, so it's about 45 minutes. Uh, and this first uh, video is, I think, about, I want to say about 20. Uh, so anyway, I'm going to share that with you. And uh, then we're going to talk 
uh, after we look at this first video, we're going to talk a little bit about his work and, you know, kind of what it's all about and, uh, you know, kind of put it in some kind of historical context. Okay. And uh, hopefully that will help you guys. So, all right. So let's see. Yes, this is the one we want. Here. Uh, let's end it right. Uh, it won't matter anyway. Look. All right, away we go. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, I think we can stop it about there. Unless we want to go on about his films. Um, anybody have any reactions to some of the work that you saw? Uh, it looks like he has something to say about let me start again. A confrontation. Ah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody else? Confrontation, huh? Yeah. Okay. Anybody it looks else? Like he... Bar bar. Mm hmm. Eloise, why don't you go ahead? He looks like it looks like he was uh, depicting a lot of the unrest, a lot of the negativity, a lot of the problems of the day. If I were in the future looking back, I would say this is a really difficult time. Very few periods of enjoyment and contentment. But mm -hmm. he was apparently an excellent artist. How large were his uh, pictures, paintings? Uh, they varied in size. I mean, some of them were quite large and then others are, you know, relatively small. Um, you know, on average, you know, I'd say, you know, 1824, 2430, you know, kind of in that range. His big, uh, like the ones that he has multiple people and stuff in, uh, those tend to be larger. You know, those might be, you know, like four or five feet, you know. Right. Why? He sure could capture emotion. Mm -hmm. And he looked like it looked like a lot of his pictures were almost photorealistic. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, his more finished work, I think, kind of takes. He went through a period where it it was really kind of almost like photoreal, and then uh, and now he's gone back to being more painterly. Now, mm -hmm. you know, he he went through a he's had a long art career. And uh, he started off uh, like Bert Silverman and so many others, you know, as a commercial illustrator. And then, um, you know, from doing commercial illustration, you know, he went into, you know, doing more fine art, portraiture, things like that. And that seems to be kind of a natural transition for a lot of illustrators, you know, myself included. You know, after doing illustration, you know, doing portraits is, feels pretty comfortable actually, you know, uh, you know, because again, you know, you're used to working toward trying to please a client. Uh, and a lot of artists have a hard time with that, you know, because their orientation isn't really about, you know, an end product and the client as much as it is a process and saying what they wanted to say. So a lot of illustrators, I think, end up doing portraiture uh, just because it, it seems like a comfortable kind of natural transition. Um, you know, that, that and they move into, you know, teaching art, <laughs> you know, kind of like me. Um, you know, because they understand, you know, technical processes and, and things like that. And they, you no, know, they're not all good at explaining it, but, you know, a lot of them are pretty good at, you know, kind of explaining the process, uh, you know, to people, you know. So, uh, so that seems to be kind of the natural migration, you know, out of illustration and into, you know, the, the fine art. Uh, that explains why it looked like a cavalcade of news uh, stories. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he, yeah, he, uh, like I said, you know, he started off as an illustrator and um, he did, he did a variety of illustration work. A lot of what they showed though was his uh, book covers because he worked for a lot of New York publishing houses, uh, which is why he was in New York in the first place. And most illustrators were, um, you know, to, to more or less work with the book publishers. Um, there and and do cover art, you know, covers and interiors. So, uh, you know, he did that for a long time. And then, like I said, he, he transitioned into doing portraits and, you know, his work kept evolving and mostly what he's doing now. He's doing, uh, I, I guess you could call it narrative work, uh, kind of a lot like Bo Bartlett. Um, you know, Bo never did an illustration or anything. He just went almost directly into narrative. 
but you know, Max kind of evolved into this kind of narrative uh, sort of work. And, you know, very, very strong figure painter, good portraitist, uh, but, you know, um, you, you kind of touched on it, you know, uh, Bernice got close, you know, as far as what he's really painting is, he's painting like everyday life, you know, just everyday people. Um, you know, he lives in New York City, you know, and if you've ever been to New York, it's hard to get away from people. You can't, you know, they're all around you all the time. Uh, and so that became sort of the predominant theme of his work, you know, people and sort of the human condition. And, uh, and he, he's got some beautiful and really powerful work. Um, you know, uh, did, did a couple of good sized pieces uh, about the war, you know, war movement, you know, protesting, you know, the war. Um, you know, he was after all a child of the sixties. <laughs> you know? So, you know, he was around during that period of time. Um, so, uh, yeah, he's, he's got some great work. Anybody else? Uh, I think John, you had something you wanted to throw in there. Yeah. I just say really powerful, uh, presentations and the work, uh, and the subject matter, and obviously had a command of anatomy and figures, uh, the, uh, the people, uh, just look natural. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, he, he had a couple of paintings, you know, particularly like the one in the park with all the people on the bench. And, you know, you, if you start really looking at that painting and, you know, and they did, you know, they kind of went in and did small sections of it. Yeah, it's, it's like each one, you know, it, it's like each little section of that painting is a beautiful painting all in itself. Yeah, they really are. And, um, uh, and again, you know, just kind of catching that kind of wide, you know, uh, wide span of human experience in life, you know, from, you know, being very young to, you know, being kind of at the end of the journey, you know, very old and uh, infirmed. So, uh, you know, very, very powerful work, you know, I, I always like his stuff. And, uh, and he's an excellent teacher, um, you know, he, teach uh he teaches at the art students league in new york and uh i think maybe a couple of other places but uh anyway we're gonna we're gonna jump into watching a uh a demonstration that he's gonna do a portrait demo and um you know keep in mind you know this is this overall i think this whole portrait demo probably took him about two hours okay so it's a very quick, very a la prima approach. Uh, and it's, it's not, you know, a studio approach. Uh, so this is what he would basically do more or less as a preliminary, as a study, you know, before he does a final portrait, you know, or anything like that. So we're going to look at that real quick. And uh, let's see, it's just really and then we'll we'll go from there. And uh, I'll try to answer any questions I can along the way. But you know, this starts out from the very beginning, and like I said, it's got three parts. They're about fifteen minutes each, uh, so they're not real, real long. But you know, I think it's a pretty good, pretty good example of his work in this process. Okay, I'm going to get started. What I'm going to do is a demonstration and painting a person. And uh, I'm going to explain well, what I'm doing as I go. Right now, I'm opening up the cups for, for, my, for my liquids that I use. And one of them is terpenoid, and the other one is uh, linseed oil. I use the terpenoid in order to wash the brush and free the paint at the beginning. When I'm starting to paint, uh, more as a wash drawing. 
Uh, and then uh, as I go, I'll use the oil as a way of thinning the paint but keeping a certain amount of body so it doesn't get too thin. And then I use linseed oil for that. See, I'm putting some linseed oil into my cup now. Okay. Now, I mentioned to the, my class earlier that I often paint on a tone panel, which means uh, a panel that's gray, you know, one kind of a gray or, uh, or another. And uh, <clears throat> I like, well, often I like to do that because it, I can uh, it more quickly get into the light colors. You can't paint the light colors until you have the darks down. Because if you try to paint, let's say, the light or uh, skin color or the blouse, it's going to be very much like this white surface. So I have to build up the darks and lights. All right, now <clears throat> I'm just working on this, uh, so this size or proportion. So I'm going to try and fit the head on so it'll look right for me in terms of size and space. Okay, I start off with dipping that brush in the turpentine or turpentine and getting a darker color, but it would be more as a wash. In this case, I'm using the burnt umber and the uh, ultramarine blue. And as I go, I might even decide to change the size or position of what I'm doing. Can you turn your head a little more that way? Yeah. yeah. And sometimes as I go, you see, I start to fuss and change the position of things. Now, I was mentioning to my class before that this approach in painting is an alla prima, where I'm getting the basic drawing down directly with the paint. I'm not doing a preliminary drawing. And you can see I'm dividing the face into several areas because I know that I want the front of the face to be more in this direction. So it's kind of a three quarter view. And uh, I'm leaving a certain amount of distance from here to the top. And I like to have a little more space on the side that she's looking. Well, just because it's a darker color. There's no particular reason for the color, it's just the value. So I can build up my drawing and see where things are going to go. And as you can see, I'm changing things as I go in order to get the basic drawing down. <laughs> 
I'm just going into a brush a little bit bigger. Just to get my values in place because I'm interested in, can you all hear me? Yeah. Because I'm interested in getting the uh, basic tones down before I get into any kind of development or detail. Now, sometimes I switch around to try to put a little more tone on before even developing a lot of the face. Because it's a white surface and I want to be able to get some of the darks in the background. Obviously, you see that the darks in the background are like the hair darker than the shade on the face. This is just to get the values so that I'll be able to develop the lights on the face. Now you see, this is largely using turf, and this is going to dry pretty fast. Now sometimes when I develop these things, I'll go, I'll go into a more careful uh, drawing first, even just with the line and the brush. And sometimes I'll get a little more into the basic tones, which it looks like I'm going in that direction now. But I'm still going to work for some of the drawing aspects before I do. Right now it's just the values. You see, I'm using a dark color just to developing a little bit of the placement of the eye or the shade over here so I can see this little triangle. And this all flows right into the neck, the shade does. All right, I want to stop this just for a second. Just take a look at this real carefully. Um, does that look really familiar to, to you guys as far as like when I sent out that drawing demo and, uh, you know, I broke up, you know, the proportions of the head into uh, roughly about thirds and I found the front plane of the face where the light was and then separated it from the side plane and the shadow. And, and so he's basically just going through the same process. You know, it's identical. Uh, he's just using paint where I was using, uh, I think I was using graphite for that. Did you always start this loose? 
Não. Não, eu vejo de diferentes maneiras. Depende do que eu estou sentindo neste momento. Mas, geralmente, a ideia básica é que eu estou tentando obter a estrutura do rosto. É uma estrutura, basicamente. E uma sort of organic conexão com tudo. As coisas podem se kind of desenvolver mais in a spatial way. With the other, it's like you're dealing with a photograph, you know, there's the establishment of a flat design based on whatever the photograph takes. And one of my father's classmates at the National Academy of Design, you know, was Rachel Sawyer. And he was, he was helpful in many ways because he had the same social point of view in expressing these social ideas. And I found him very helpful in that respect. But I felt, I felt his work should have been a little more realistically drawn and painted. Although he felt it was. Uh, Rafael Sawyer, some of you may know him. You know Rafael Sawyer? No? Rafael yeah, some... Sawyer? Not huh? Rafael, yeah. Raphael? Yeah. yeah, my father Sawyer. went to the National Academy of Design in 1920, and he was a classmate. Now what I'm, what I'm doing now is trying to define the basic shape of the whole thing. See, I'm trying to establish where my shapes are. But at the same time, I want to get the basic darks and lights on the face. Now, one of the things that I point out is to try to paint what you see and the forms that you see. So instead of getting like the eyebrow and the outline of the eye, I'm looking for the basic shapes of dark and light shapes that are there. So for example, on, on her right eye, the left side, I see a certain form going diagonally up and down for what we would call the corner of the eye. And then it sort of comes down into the eye. So you see, this is the reality of what I see. And I'm saying this uh, in a way because uh, I've been trying to get the students to avoid going by this um, approach of following an anatomy book of how an eye is drawn or how it looks. It helps, but at the same time, you want to get the character of the individual posing. See, and that's important to me. Now you see, I have a certain amount of tone in here, and now I can start to build up a little of that tone, but I'll still keep working on the drawing to be sure that my drawing is right. I'm going to start to put in some light colors, and I'm using white and the cadmium red pale. I think I'm going to put a little of the light green in there. Just to get a light color, maybe a touch of blue. Just to get it a little cooler. Did you know that you may qualify for roofing help this winter, even if you could afford to pay cash for a new roof? Okay. If you have a roof leak, visible roof okay. deterioration. On to part two. <laughs> Unless you guys need a roof. <laughs> Whoop, wait a minute. Okay, I'm sorry. Now, the one thing that I notice here is that my 
I skipped ahead for, wait a minute. No, nope. let's go back again. Come on. There we go. Part two. There we go. That's what it was. Skip some ads. Okay, I'm going to get started. What I'm going to do is a demonstration in painting a person, and uh, I'm going to explain well, what right, I'm doing as I go. And right now, I'm opening up the cups for, for my for my liquids that I use, and one of them is turpenoid, and the other one is uh, linseed oil. I use the turpenoid in order to. Sorry about that. There we go. Let's try that. So you see he's beginning to lay in some color. But why did he say that blue? I just now I heard you say blue color. Together with the viridian and... I'm sorry, what was the question, Linda? Sorry, he mentioned something like he's putting down the blue color or something like that. So I was a bit One amused of, by... Yeah, he's, he's putting down yeah, uh, light. See, he's beginning to... Like he started off with uh, mm -hmm. the cad red, white, a little bit of... Uh, right real light green um you know just green? to make like a basic flesh tone um uh -huh. real light and this is like one of the lightest areas of his uh, painting and so you mm -hmm. can put that in to establish it and get the range of value and contrast between the light side and the shadow side say mm -hmm. and then, so you know he, now that he knows how light his light is going to be then he can begin to gauge you know all the different values on the uh the shadow side itself okay yes thank you the darker green you get the shade of the nose So I hope you hear me okay. It's a bit yeah. weird here on the beach. I just had a quick tip to share with you. I hate ads on YouTube.
You sweat. Hmm? You sweat. No, I don't have to. I used to. So you try to see how values collide. Now you squint to avoid seeing details because your details get in the way. Now, well, part of what I'm doing is to try to simplify to get the basic form or what I perceive as a sculptural form in the head. So, for example, in the eye here, I get the light from the lid going down to the bottom lid through the eyeball that's in the eye socket. So then I begin to get that sculptural feeling. See, now even putting in a dock, for example, over here, uh, develops that round ball area. Now, for example, over here in the cheek, see, it's a little warmer. But above the mouth, the area is a little cooler by comparison. So therefore, I'm using more of the green together uh, with the other paint, with the white and the red. But it's more green so that this becomes a cooler area than this red. Now, of course, the mouth itself is a little reddish. So you have the color of the lipstick. Now also, one of the things I'm trying to do is not to get a linear look. So I try not to get the lines of the mouth, sort of the outline of the lips, or the line separating up and bottom lip. At this point, I'm trying to get the sculpture of it so that there is the dark tone of the upper lip, for example, and part of the bottom lip here, you see that takes up most of that tone, and it doesn't stand out. It's not as contrasting. I see here I've indicated the corner of the mouth, but I'm looking to see how it relates to the nose and the eye. Now, I'm beginning to sense that perhaps the eye here has to be a little higher or the cheek has to be longer. So as I continue, I keep on correcting my drawing. Okay. 
Now you can probably see that I'm changing things as I go. For example, there is the light above the eyebrow. So that, that in a way defines a little of the eyebrow and the eye area, you see, but it also gives me the feeling of that form, that sculptural form that is in the lower part of the forehead. And it even goes over a little onto this side. So you also have a little bit of that sculptural form here too. Now, as I look at this, I'm beginning to see that her head is rounder. So I have to try to make it a little wider in places. Perhaps over here, it should be wider and maybe the forehead doesn't go up that high. This is another example of where I'm trying to correct as I go. Now, while I want to keep a certain uh, light and dark, at the same time, I kind of enjoy getting a certain transparency in the shade. So I think I'm gonna to have to make some of the shading in the side of the face a little bit lighter. I also see that it's a little wider and this little triangle here, I probably have a little too big. So I'm gonna to have to cut that down. But now I just put a little more green into it because down here I didn't want it so red and I wanted to see what it's like if I make it lighter. See now probably that is not dark enough for this light. So I may have to make that light lighter or a combination. Now, if you will, just take a look at this for a second, okay? What part of that has any detail whatsoever? Almost none of it, right? You know, it's just, it's just, uh, it, it's a, it's a foundation. It's a structure, see? And this is what I keep talking about you know, over and over again when you're trying to paint a portrait or really anything else, you know. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of you are in a big hurry to make it look like the thing, you know, and by trying to put in details. <clears throat> and the fact is, it's not about the details. It's about the structure. And that's what he keeps talking about. So he's looking at his value. He's looking at his proportions and trying to get those values in there correctly to begin to build that underlying form and structure. And as you can see, you know, if you just squint your eye down, you can see a human face there, right, already. It's, it's you know, now, you know, it, there's no details, but the basic structure of the head is there and the value structure is there and it begins to turn, okay? And that's kind of the beautiful thing about it is it's just, it's, you know, understanding that process, you know, and, and getting that down will improve your ability to paint somebody greatly. See, when I use the paint thicker and I put it on, then I do get that brightness. Are you using oil? Yeah. No, no, just paint.
Now over here, I'm going to put in a tone to start going into the hair. You see, and it's not exactly the dark brown that most of the hair is. Over here, it's a little bit uh, subdued or um, light, light grayish brown. And now I will get some of the ultramarine blue and the uh, burnt umber and block in some of the hair over here. Was that the time? No. Well, how long is it going to be? How are you doing? You need a break? Yeah, it probably be good. You think a break would be good? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, like 40 minutes. Yeah, you know, kids these days. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, take a break. Take a break. You know, I'll tell you, it's good to take a break because then you look at something with a fresh eye. See, besides, I have to get more paint down. I want to clean my palette. My palette is too loaded with paint. But there's a lot that I have to correct. I see it in the painting. You know, in order to get her. Now, I'm just trying to... Um, tone a little of the hair here down the side so this doesn't look like it's a hard edge against the forehead. See, I want it to be a little subdued. So you see, I'm going over with the brush to blend a little of the edge of the forehead into the hair. Now this kind of blending I like to do with these big brushes as opposed to a sable because it gives me a more painterly feeling and there's something aesthetic in that quality that I like. When do you use a sable? Sometimes if I'm working on a little detail and I can't get into it, I need a small tiny brush. I'll get into it that way. Roofers are furious about this new metal roofing product that's going viral. And right now, applications okay. are being accepted for showcase homes in your area. Let's, uh, let's see if we can go to part three. Charles, I was um, interested in the large brush he uses. Mm -hmm. It may be, maybe I need to use a larger brush because it seems to create that structure more. What is it, about an eight filbert or something? Uh, I'm guessing it's probably about a 12 or a 14. Oh, wow. Yeah, and it's, yeah, it's a filbert. Um, and the thing is, using a filbert, it's got that rounded edge to it. And if you look at the way he uses it, um, a lot of times, you know, as he's making the stroke, he'll also, like, roll his hand. And what that will do is, uh, that takes that edge and it pulls that one edge into the other wet paint and begins to blend and soften at the same time that he's making the paint stroke. So he gets a, a crisp edge and a soft, which is what you're looking for, you know, in a portrait. Okay. So. That here is in my proportions that uh, the mouth is either too high or the distance from the mouth to the chin is too small or too large. So I have to make adjustments.
Sorry, I was in. Uh, if, for example, the upper lip is stark on both sides, but on the light side, it tends to be a little lighter. So it almost softly, you know, it doesn't contrast with the skin above it. Harry and David makes Mother's Day easy. Share a gift made with love with the mom in your life. Choose from. See underneath the chin, there's a light shade. So there's a kind of a transparency here. So I'm trying to get that lightness, but then again, I have to counter it with a light enough light here, so that still looks like shade. So, you know, right now I put down a red on the side, but that's a little too hard. So I'm gonna subdue it by coming in with more of a gray. So the tone of the face turns around, around the side of the face.
And for some reason, you probably noticed, I'm going across the bone of the nose instead of going up and down. I feel it gives me a more solid feel to the nose. I mean, that's the only way I can explain it. The other way, I just had a, like white streaks going all the way up and down. So I'm correcting the drawing also on the nose because I made her nose too short. So I'm lengthening it. So here I use the little um, Elizabeth Crimson with the green. So it makes the shade a little bit more intense. And here I put a little more green in because I see a reflected shade there that tends to be more green than the bottom of the nose. I'd like to get the definition of the mouth a little stronger. I'd like to get the eyes a little more correct. And it's a problem because sometimes working detail is not the answer. There's a more general answer that the shapes in general have to be more correct. See, by also making the face wider, I tend to get a little more of her, the roundness of her face. So I widen this area here from the eye to the ear. And here over here in the ear, I'm using a little blue <coughs> because uh, in some ways it's a little cooler or lighter than the side of the face. So I must say, I mean, there is a certain expression that I'm trying to go for, you know, the way her head is tilted a little bit and she is looking off like this and her eyes are not totally open. So there's a kind of expression in that and that look of the eye that is, I find interesting, very characteristic of her. See here there's that, <clears throat> that uh, sort of silvery highlight in her lid. And this is uh, something that I usually try and talk about in teaching because it's the idea that the lid is not going like a horizontal line but it's more of a uh, area like a round ball. So you have the highlight in that one spot and this will give more the impression of a total round ball of the eye in a socket. Is that why your brush strokes are vertical rather than horizontal? Sometimes, yes, to get the side. Also to get the feel that there's the tone going through here. I still may come across with a slight tone for the lid of the eye or the shade of the eyelid in the eye.
Right. A lot of one missing. Mixing the color. Oh, sometimes, yeah. When I put it down and it's wet on wet, it's going to mix a little bit. So I have to determine how much I want to mix it. If I put it on heavy, it mixes a lot. If I put it on light, it blends differently. You know, the different things that are going to happen. And sometimes I anticipate, but a lot of times uh, I'm experimenting. Is that it? That's it, that's it. Thank you very much. So what do we think? Any thoughts? Well, I like the way that um, he paints, but I probably would have kept on going thinking that I wasn't finished. Mm -hmm. And he has almost a finished piece there. Uh, you still see the, the strokes. So I just probably need to know when enough is enough. Yeah. Uh, after you capture the essence of the person and let it go. So I don't, I don't know. Now, now keep a couple of things in mind. One, this was a live demonstration. So the model had a set time that she was going to sit and no more. Number two, this wouldn't really be considered a finished piece of studio work, all right? Okay. Okay. It, it was an a la prima. And uh, okay. so I, I think if he had his preference, he probably would have worked for another 45 minutes to another hour. Okay. Probably develop, you know, some of the lines of the feature in the face, things like that, mm -hmm. um, while still trying to maintain sort of that very painterly quality to mm -hmm. the form underneath. And um, that's that's one of the big, I think, big challenges, you know, for even me at this point, is when when to leave things alone, right? Because you get, you know, you get this nice beginning, you know, and very nice painterly quality, and you keep putzing with it until it just all goes away. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I'm a good good reason for that. Mm -hmm. but you know what? They always paint young people. When you go to paint older people, the the sag lines are much more pronounced. Sure. The the and it's it's very difficult to to get a halfway decent looking thing. I'd like to see somebody paint an older person so I get an idea what to do. Yeah, actually, um, no, I've seen some demos uh, of portrait painting that painted an older person. And um, yeah, I mean, in fact, uh, I think in many ways, uh, and particularly older men, uh, are easier to paint than, say, younger women and children. Right, and the reason I would say that is because you can get away with leaving some of those harder edges and lines in in a uh, older male face that you can't with a young, you know, a young child or a young woman. Okay. You also can't get away with it with an older woman either. I no. Mean, it looks it well. Looks like a mess. Yeah, you can't run into that right yeah, now. Yeah, you can a little bit, but yeah, you've you've got to. You know, it's it's all a matter of degree, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And you just got to get them. Do portraits, it's very difficult to start uh, start up and try and make one. Yeah. It's kind of, it's kind of like doing making folds uh, in a dress or something. You got to know what wisdom aligns to leave out, you know, <laughs> at the face. <laughs> and when you start leaving them out, then it doesn't look like the person, though. It well, it looked like her yesterday. <laughs> Oh Lord! That's, you, don't, you don't have to put every wrinkle in to get it to. I put every fold in. Like, like, 
like the person, you know, I mean, again, it all goes back to if you get the proportion of the face and the structure and things like that, yeah, then you got them. Uh, and if you don't have that, then you're not ever going to get them. So, and that's... Well, you, you've shot some uh, interesting portraits of older men and uh, the ones of the Native Americans uh, and things like that that were quite wrinkled and uh, leathery skin, but it were fantastic portraits. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's what I'm saying. I mean, there's, you know, you want to capture the character of the person. And, uh, and you can get away with a lot of stuff on an older male uh, that, you, that you can't necessarily get away with, you know, with, with a, a female. And so it's just, uh, you know, men generally have <clears throat> more rectilinear shapes in their face. Women have softer and rounder shapes in their face. And so, you know, just by the character of the way you lay down the paint, you know, you can, you know, make it <laughs> male or female. So. A lot of commission. If you're doing a commission, a lot of people don't want you to put all of that stuff in all of those lines in their faces. No. They no. won't look glamorous. Yeah. I know. Well, they want you to, you know, that's why they're hiring a, a portrait artist and not a photographer. You know, <laughs> they don't want to, yes. they don't want to catch all that stuff. You know, they, they want to uh, selectively edit. So. Was it uh, Velasquez that was not favorable to the royal family's portrait? Well, it wasn't necessarily to the royal family. I mean, he was, he was the painter of the royal court. It was the queen uh, who was, let's just face it, she was not an attractive woman, <laughs> you know? She had a very unusual kind of harsh face. Um, and she kind of had the, uh, the personality to go with it, you know? Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he painted a lot of royal portraits, and particularly of the children and, and, the, and the king uh, himself, and they were very well received. Uh, but he had done one, you know, one major portrait of the queen with her on horseback, and, uh, you know, and he, he was accurate. You know, he painted her the way he saw her. And uh, that was the wrong thing to do. <laughs> yeah. You have to guess what she thinks she looks like and paint like that. Well, it's kind of more, you know, trying to paint her the way she would really like to look, you know. And, uh, and, and the problem with that is that, you know, at a certain point, it doesn't look like them anymore. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, they're pleased with the painting, but, you know, but they don't really see themselves like that. You know that's how they would like to be rather than the way yeah. they are so yes this is one of the problems of painting portraits that's why john singer Sargent, you know made that statement you know i will paint no more mugs <laughs> so you know just because you know you're always you know when you're painting a portrait and again, that's, that goes back to this idea about the temperament of an illustrator versus a, a fine artist is that, you know, you're working for a client, you know, you're trying to please the client. Uh, and at the end of the day, that's really the only thing that matters. Okay. Vanity is costly. <clears throat> well, it can be, can be. <coughs> yeah. Um, you know, most portrait painters, um, you know, they, they will, they will charge you for revisions, you know, and particularly if, if they've shown you preliminaries and you've approved that, and then you go back in and, you know, want to make like major changes to it. Yeah. They will charge you for that. So, but yeah, most of the time you try to keep care of that up front so that you don't have that problem. <laughs> you know. I have a question. I have a question about his uh, technique. Mm -hmm. Since he was doing the Alla Prima and uh, he was putting on the paint pretty heavy, mm -hmm. if you go back to make details on top of that, uh, would it cause the 
future cracking of the painting later on? Um, well, probably not. Um, now it it depends. You know, it depends on what you. I mean, you don't want to go back in and repaint that whole surface. You know, um, again, you you kind of treat that as this is a study, and it remains a study. Okay. Uh, and you use that as a foundation to go, you know, and then do a final piece. You don't paint over that, but you take what you've learned in the experience of painting that into uh, a finished piece of work. You know? Because at this point now, he's, he's much more familiar with the form of her face, the proportions, uh, the, uh, the actual outline and shape of the face. You know how what her hairline is like um, you know the length of her neck you know so he has all that down now you know not only in the painting but in his own mind uh, you know he's he's basically learned a little bit about her and then when he goes back in and he does if you were to do a final portrait it wouldn't be on that canvas it would be he would start another painting you know but he would take everything that he learned from that you know, and all the decisions that he liked and, and incorporate them into the final painting. Um, but again, you know, even in the final painting, you know, he's, he's probably going to go back in and make modifications and changes and change some of the things he doesn't like. So would you think he would do the final painting in Ala Prima? Uh, yeah, you could, you know, uh, as, a, as an Ala Prima approach, you know, there's nothing really wrong with it. Um, the difference being that an alla prima final portrait you would probably not be as aggressive with the paint you know in the beginning okay. Okay. so you would build it up more slowly and uh, you know but you know when you've got a when you've got a two-hour window you know to paint a human head uh you know there's a lot of ground to cover there so you've got to get to it very quickly and, and again, you know, you just keep in mind, you know, you got to keep it in context as to, you know, what, what are your goals? You know, it's a difference of, of going outside and doing a plein air painting versus sitting in the studio later on and trying to paint that same scene in the studio. In the studio, the light's not going to change, right? You know, you, you've already got your photographic reference. You've got your a la prima painting to look at. Uh, you know, you've got all your notes and everything, and, and then you can begin to do that final painting. And, you know, so you can, you know, you can adjust things. You know, you know the parts that you want to keep of that alla prima painting. You know the parts that, uh, you know, you maybe want to modify, make better. You know, maybe you want to change the composition slightly. Um, so you make choices. So most most of the a la prima, I mean, most of the um, plein air painters that do the landscapes, they're doing studies first and then they go back in the studio and do a, a different painting? No, no, the, the, the plein air piece, though, is really not a final painting. I mean, they end up being or sold as a final painting because now there's a market for that, right? There are people who want that very direct you know, short, you know, uh, statement. And so there are a lot of painters, you know, painting in that a la prima plein air style um, and selling their work. But if you ever really, if you ever get a chance to go, you know, to a gallery and actually see some of those paintings, you'll be shocked and amazed at how small they are, you know because they're not going to be very big. You know, I mean, an 11 by 14 is a big plein air painting. You know, oh. yeah. Mm -hmm. Most, most uh, plein air painters uh, work on like six by nine, five by sevens. You know, we're looking small paintings, uh, mm -hmm. not big paintings. Uh, they use you, do you use a big brush on those as, as well anyway? Oh, yeah. You know, those small paintings? Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, A, the big brush will keep you out of trouble. <laughs> because it will, it will stop you from nitpicking too soon. Detail. Yeah. See? So that, you know, with that big brushing, you can be very efficient with it. And remember, too, that uh, depending on the time of the day, okay, you can have anywhere up to about, you know, half an hour to 45 minutes to work on that painting. Or you could have 10 minutes before the light is totally changed. So that's why you use a big brush when you get in, you know, the big, you know, big statements, you know, and you have to let the rest of it go. You got to simplify it because if, if you, if you get nitpicky with it, you know, half hour later, you're painting a different tree because the lights changed. It's on, on the other side of it now. And so I am thinking about trying to do some plein air painting. So do you suggest that I do them first on a small canvas and then go back and do another one on a canvas that I intend to uh, keep? Oh, um, well, okay. My answer is don't go get big canvases. Work small. Mm -hmm. Use big brushes and simplify and um you know and and let let them be what they are you know um you know there's a there's a big difference between a studio painting or of a landscape and a plain air they're two totally different animals you know it's like going to a uh, it's like going to some of these figure groups right and you know you do a quick figure study versus you know a long study you know, of a figure, uh, you know, in, in the studio, you know, it's, uh, you just, you know, where you might have a model come back and sit four or five times, you know, for two or three hours, you know, at a session, uh, you know, to do a uh, finished figurative painting, you know, that's that, uh, you know, that study, you know, from life, you know, maybe you had 30 minutes. Say. So again, you know, you, it's, it's, it's a different animal. Um, you know, one, you're exploring, you know, you're trying to, you're trying to get information, you're trying to find something, you're, you know, you're, you're building an experience, you know, with that subject. You know, the other, you're taking what you've learned, and you're trying to embellish it, you know, and bring it out into a finished piece of work. So, you Thank know, remember, you. remember when we looked at uh, a lot of Max's work this morning, they had some canvases. They were probably like 16 by 20s or whatever, and they weren't even framed. You know, they were just canvases and they were just hanging on the wall, but they were very loose and painterly. You know, they looked like an early stage, like in that demo that we just watched, right? You know, you could tell you know, that it was a person and which direction their head was turning, but there were no details, right? That's more like a figurative study. And, and see, that's the thing about, you know, looking at a body of an artist's work. You know, if you, uh, not everything is finished. Not everything has to be finished. Not everything's meant to be finished. It's, you know, sometimes the beauty of it is, you know, the fact that, you know, it was there, it was live, and there's a different quality to them, you know, totally, than something that's been worked on in the studio and belabored on. And uh, in many ways, um, like in my own personal work, I would say I much prefer a lot of my, my preliminary and, and sort of, uh, you know, type studies and, and things that I develop more than I do the finished pieces. Yeah, because there's some life in those. And in the finished pieces, uh, and you know, I freely admit, I overwork, you know, a lot of those things, you know, because I just got to keep in, you know, picking at it. <laughs> you know? And so, you know, just like all of you, I'm trying to learn, you know, to do better at that, and know when to stop, when to walk away. And, and not take all the life out of it, so.
you know. Never count your money. <laughs> Pardon? I was thinking about the gambler. <laughs> gambler, uh-huh, yep. Yeah, yeah, when to hold them, when to fold them. That's right. <laughs> yep, that's right. Yeah, that's, that's you know, that is that is the hardest thing, I think, for any artist to learn, is when to stop, you know? Because, I mean, you know, there, there's times when just laying those initial brush strokes down, there's a beauty all into itself, you know, and you could just walk away and it makes a beautiful piece of art. But you make one or two more brush strokes on it and you just like, it just goes away. It's gone. You know, the, the magic has disappeared. So, anyhow. Uh, it's 11.41, folks. Okay. Yay. Yay. Okay, so, uh, you know, I'm gonna go eat lunch. Uh, we will be back here at two o'clock. Uh, I checked my email just before I opened up the class, and uh, you know there was, uh, you know there was, you know a few emails from you guys. So if you've got work that you want to talk about, uh, you know things you want to look at, um, then go ahead and send it in. I'll try to gather it up and get it in the queue, and we will be back here at two o'clock. Okay. Oh, uh, one quick, one quick question. Yeah. I haven't seen Wanda. I haven't seen Wanda. Does anybody know where Wanda is? Yeah, I don't know. She, she's in New York with, with the, her mother. Oh, is she? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, she she dropped in, what was it, a week ago or so? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she, she, just, she just logged in, but she, 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 she's on vacation, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, okay. good to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, you know, as far as I know, she's okay. So. Oh, yeah, she's fine. All right, guys. So we'll see you too. See y'all later. Bye. Thank you. Bye.